farmers themselves have got great ideas, whether it be evaluating or tech solutions to problems that they're experiencing. And so they could realistically um, imagine themselves as founders of new ventures. G'day and welcome to the Farms Vice podcast with your host, Jack Creswell. Whether you farm it, service it, or just love it, this podcast is for you. We'll bring you the techniques and technologies you can implement into your day straight from the leaders and innovators themselves. Spread the farm's advice so that we can reach more farmers right across Australia. Follow us on all of your socials at Farms Advice and let's get into this episode. G'day and welcome to the Farms Advice podcast. We have a very special episode breaking it open into discovering the innovations within Australian agriculture and how that plays a role. And we'll be linking up with Farmers to Founders through Christine Pitt, Daryl Lyons, on today's episode and really opening us up for this series for farmers at the heart of innovation and how that is driving some real change in Australian agriculture. But we'll get to know a little bit about behind who's the audio on today. So Christine, if you'd like to introduce yourself to to see who you are and how you've become this role within Farmers to Founders. G'day, Jack. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, So, yeah, Farmers to Founders was formed um, in 2018. Um, So I'm uh, the managing director and founder of Farmers to Founders. And I guess it came off the back of about 20 years working in the agri-food sector, um, particularly with Meat and Livestock Australia. And there were two main things that really prompted me to think about a company like Farmers to Founders. One was really wanting to put producers, as you said, at the centre of innovation. We saw that there was a lot of stuff going on out there that um, was meant to be benefiting producers but didn't really acknowledge or understand or um, create a role or an engagement process for producers. So that was one of the drivers. And then the other one was really starting to think about what were some of the disruptions that were required for farmers and more broadly across the agri-food tech system And so I'd done a couple of years of work with startups while I was still at Meat and Livestock Australia and really got excited by the opportunity. So I guess those were the two real genesis for why we started the business. Absolutely. And it also comes through quite nicely in the name, literally Farmers to Founders, and how they're sort of looking at the problems and the the solving them with their own solution, but also how do they get to that next stage if it is a great idea and if they're looking to commercialise and actually have that piece at the end of it, whether it's ag tech or it's value adding for their farm and how that plays a role within Australian agriculture. We're all looking towards a $100 billion goal. And I think this is one of the most exciting parts of Australian agriculture currently. Just recently, AgQuip, and it's booming within the event sector as well. And just the interest is really there for it. How have you seen the changes over since, I suppose, from 2018, but also within agriculture in the last five years? Or ag tech. Yeah, look, it's a, the farmers to founders, as you pointed out, it's a bit of a play on words there. So farmers to founders is meant to sort of imply that, yeah, farmers themselves have got great ideas, whether it be valuating or tech solutions to problems that they're experiencing. And so they could realistically um, imagine themselves as founders of new ventures. And, and what we're trying to do is obviously provide them with that pathway so that they can have success in bringing those ideas to life. But the other play on words for farmers to founders is farmers with founders working together. And as I said before, we we saw a lot of really interesting disruption in the technology space happening, you know, pre-2018. But one of the real problems we saw was that lack of engagement and understanding of producers and their problems and, you know, what the solutions really needed to look like. So the farmers to founders was also a platform or a vehicle to bring tech solution providers much closer to producers. And so I guess, yeah, you're right. I think over the last four or five years, we've seen some quite significant changes, um, not the least of which is is just the acceleration of the number of players in the space, Um, you know, the interest from a wider group of stakeholders. So investors are starting to get involved. Industry bodies are starting to see that there there is something that's happening out there and startups and producers can play a really important role in that government's starting to pay attention as well. And so we're getting some really good um, funding and grants and investment as well. So I think the first thing that we've noticed is just the sheer escalation in attention that we're getting. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, we all understand that the last 
two and a half years has had COVID um, playing a big impact globally on the agri-food system. And so I think the the kind of the burning platform there is is there now that we need to do something about this. We can't just rely on it happening by a natural evolution. So there's a much greater sense of urgency. I guess that's the other thing that we're seeing. Amazing. And also that facilitating what farmers are founders and giving the these founders and farmers um, the ability to take their ideas, their conceptions right the way through the whole process is pretty important for farmers because without their 25, 50 years experience out in the field, five years experience out in the field, they probably wouldn't have had this idea, but now they can rely on a body, an organisation such as Farmers to Founders to bring that to fruition. Yeah, I, I guess we're, we're sort of positioning ourselves. We think we've got a pretty unique value proposition, whether it is a producer who's looking to um, build their idea, test it in the marketplace, see whether it's a good idea, whether it's worth pursuing, and then going through that um, whole journey of creating a venture, commercialising their technology, or even a, a you know an, an ag tech solution provider at their early stages. We're not just a program, so we don't just offer an accelerator program or a pre-accelerator program. We really see this as a whole life journey, if you like, the, the journey of that or the life journey of that startup. And so we want to get in early. We've got some, you know, some really early stimulus that people can just go online and do our journey starter program and start to see whether this even feels like something that they want to progress. Um, we have a look at what they do there and then we can start to bring them through. If they come through at that stage, they'll go through a natural pro progression of what we call our hatch program, which is really about customer discovery. Is there a real problem out there? Is there a genuine need for what your idea might be trying to solve? And how do you start to understand that at a much deeper level and get yourself aligned to that problem that that producer or that customer will have before you start investing a whole bunch of your time and, and money into things that maybe nobody really wants and it's not going to hit the mark. And then as they progress through that, we bring them into the HONE program, which is teaching them and helping them think through what kind of structure do I want to have? Is this a business that I'm creating? What are all the things that I need to be thinking about there? And then starting to build and test and validate their minimum viable product or their early prototype of their idea. And then there's like a natural progression and eventually they come into our harvest program and we've also got internationalization scale-up programs, uh, one being called Grow to Asia. And so this journey is sort of meant to put some milestones, if you like, of programs and support during that journey. And then wrapping around that is the is the pathway. So we don't, you know, you don't just come into one of our programs and then we say, see you later. Um, hope you do well. We, we really hang on to those um, participants and that alumni, keep them going. It might take them three, six, nine, 12 months, whatever it is between programs. And so we keep working with them, keep, keep connected keeping them connected. And then when they're ready, we bring them into the next stage, the next sort of logical stage. But people could come in at any stage. You don't have to start at the beginning and go right through. Depends on where they're up to really. And we we encourage people to just get on our website or to book office hours with us so we can have a yarn with them and say, okay, what's your idea? Where are you up to? Where's your business up to? What are you really finding you're struggling with? And then we try and help place them into the right sort of part of that program and that journey that's going to be best for them. Absolutely. It sounds like a bit of a farmer hopscotch going on there with the process <laughs> and running them <laughs> structure as well. I've been enjoying watching and listening into who's coming through these hatch programs um, just to see how it is and maybe what sort of technology or value adding they will bring to the table. Um, but it's great work that Farmers to Founders is doing behind, a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, only people... On the outside, I only get to see a little glimpse into it until that probably has come into commercialization. And that also is probably not for everyone at the end of it anyway. Uh, but we'll dial down into the further details of what your role is, farmers to founders, and where it's going and how it can help harvest the innovators within Australian agriculture from the farmer side of it. But Daryl, we haven't forgotten you there on the other line. If you want to just introduce yourself as an entrepreneur, farmpreneur, um, within Ag Tech in Australia. How's that worked out for you and what's your role? Yeah, thanks, Jack. It's great to be here. Um, I kind of don't like the entrepreneur um, label a little bit. I, I kind of guess I'd tag myself with that word as a person who's made plenty of stuff up and made plenty of blues to get to where I got to. 
Yep. Um, so, and, it, and it's awesome being a part of Farmers to Founders and having that role to kind of share some of my stuff ups and learnings with um, other people as they start to go on this journey. Yeah, absolutely. And from coming from your end of it, how do you see the role of Farmers to Founders, how it plays a role in sort of nurturing these farmers through the founders through um, both professionally, personally, um, and also bringing their ideas into commercialization to all consumers to enjoy? I think the critical piece is the, is the farmer piece. So my parents are cattle producers and how I got into this journey was basically every time I went down for holidays at Christmas, I had to do heaps of free labor on the, on the farm. And I kind of realized there was an opportunity to put some technology on there. But the critical piece of, about that is, is um, having that producer lens on trying to solve those problems. So I reckon that's the really key piece, whether it's a tech founder or, or a farmer, to go on this, uh, to, to be at the center of any of the innovation and really understanding that problem and, and, then, and then solving it. Yeah, 100%. I think coming from your view, your family farm's view as well plays a huge role in the success of how it plays out because out there, just like the podcast, I have a few questions to ask about our family farm, um, but out there, there's probably a lot more uh, others wanting to ask that sort of question as well and have that that question answered, uh, with which may be your solution as well. So what sort of drove you to start your own ag tech venture um, within your own role? Uh, again, I was trying to solve some of the old man starting to get on as, as probably most of um, our farmers at the moment. So trying to um, put some devices and sensors and put some long range connectivity around the cattle property to make it easier for him. Uh, and then, yeah, once I started playing with that, worked out that, hey, that's applicable all across Australia. And then kind of um, applied for an accelerator. So it's SproutX Accelerators in 2016. It's lucky that was the first ag tech accelerator that kicked off. Lucky enough to go through that. Uh, I've been through two failed starts. So that company in there was called WaterSafe. Um, but that accelerator and why I value this one really opened me up to thinking uh, longer term a lot bigger. And then changing where, you know, predominantly with my businesses, I would like create a business and put everything in it, risk the house and do everything before I'd go and get a customer. Uh, so this lean startup method methodology is really around failing fast and, and not putting the kitchen sink in the farm and having a bet and actually go out and talking to a customer and talking to people like my old man and go, hey, would you buy this? Would you, you know? and without even actually spending much money to go and create those solutions. So I, I really value that process because I've been through doing it the wrong way and then now starting this and was lucky enough to form another company called Escavox, and which um, has been quite successful. Great stuff. And what, what do you think was the probably the first thing that drove you down the line of becoming founder with Escavox? What was that key driver? For yourself was it the processes that you sort of followed through to be able to bring it to light i, I guess part of the reason i ran away um from the farm when i was younger was bloody hard work uh, yeah. and i see how technology can actually really make a difference into reducing that workload and improving productivity and improving efficiency uh, and it actually will like, like fully believe it's going to make a difference and I guess in the journey of this last six or seven years as we've seen agri-tech mature um, and it's great to see you know producers really having a lot more interest in in it now as well and it's definitely maturing and there's still a lot of opportunity because as you solve something for your farm or my old man's farm when you look at the world market um, there's a lot of opportunity to create a global business that um, can scale out massively. Yeah, I think some people, when they may look at it, they just sort of think domestically. Do you think the role that Farmers the Founders Accelerator Program can actually improve the way that you look at your markets um, and looking how you can actually get out there into the world past your own sort of boundaries as a farmer? We tend to think within the farm gate. Yeah, I think it's definitely just to actually get someone to lift their head up and not look at the gate and look at that horizon and have that horizon thinking is, is a bit of a game changer for people. You still have to focus really on your old man's farm or your farm to solve that problem right there and then. Uh, that's key and really to solve that pain so they can buy it. 
but then when you do look up, there's options to really make a, a you know, a global business out of it. Absolutely. And I suppose right now as an ag tech founder, heavily involved within ag sector with your family farm, your cattle enterprise there, what appealed to you to join the F2F F2, F2F or Farmers and Founders program? Putting producers at the center of innovation is key um, because a lot of people have come from a tech um, background and, you know, the tech's going to solve everything. And we've seen some examples of that, how it doesn't work. Um, and I guess if you really have producers at the center and you're solving their pain points and getting people to understand that, and then also bringing it in so it's practical and usable and, and a lot simpler. Uh, you know, for example, my old man only um, got an email address six six years ago. So he's got a long journey to really understand, I guess, the complexities of what technology can. So, you know, on the founder side or from a tech person, it's um it they need to, you know, make that a lot more transferable and understandable and usable. Uh, and then on the farmer's side of it, like they think they can just solve the problem for their farm or their neighbor is then, you know, looking at that horizon to go, well, hang on, how many, how many people around the world have got that problem? There's a potential global business out of that. Uh, therefore, they can lean into that and understand how they can create it. Absolutely. Probably using it as a live case study for the founders where it starts from. But what would you sort of recommend for other future founders out there? That they sort of think they've got this idea. They're looking to. They think it would work in the commercial sort of space, but they're not quite sure how to get it there, or is it at the right stage to take it to the next level with farmers to founder programs? You can never be too early. You can have an idea and have not done any work, and and these programs are really valuable. Is what it actually will teach you, and that's what I've learned over my six years, and and uh, learning around that. Um, fail fast mentality where you can actually got to go and build. You don't have to build something until you go and validate it that your old man or my old man would buy it and pay for it. And you can actually test that without spending much money or any money. So I think if anyone's got an idea, the earlier they get in and learn this process and this process is can be repeatable. And if you that idea doesn't work, you've got the process to go and do the next idea or the next idea and keep going until you really land on something that solves that pain point for producers and, yep. and you're on a winner. Absolutely. And for founders, ag tech sort of startups, people going through that journey of actually just probably using it on their own farm to begin with, what sort of challenges is there with these new ag tech ventures, bringing them to light, trying to market them for ag tech companies? What are unique to the agriculture industry you've seen? It's, um, it's quite challenging because if you just say look at cattle producers and you look at how big Australia is, there's a lot of nuances and difference between, you know, a, a cattle producer offering Cape York compared to someone who's in Tassie or in New South Wales or WA. So if they have a, a product that's aimed at cattle producers, there's a lot of nuances between all of those producers. You might solve it for a, a Tassie producer, but it, it's never going to work in in northern Australia. Um, so you have to be very specific for that farming practice in a certain area, and then really understand how that farmer is going to use it to provide value. Uh, and then they've got to go and get dirt on the boots and go up to the other areas and then test it. So I feel that's the big challenge. Is um, you know that idea might not work all around the world. You actually have to go out, test it, iterate it work with a producer, get their feedback, improve it, and continually, that's a never ending process, I believe. Yes, yeah, so making it more malleable towards each sort of individual farm across Australia, as like the episodes get on, I get, tend to find out no farm is the same alike out there and how they can work with ag tech to put them into the different sort of scenarios, whether it is ag tech or it's very adding um, and how that can play a part. Not all people be able to do the same sort of thing with variating, will they? So, Yeah, totally. And it leads us into our conversation of producers at the centre of philosophy, at the centre of innovation, sorry, um, and how that can really play a part, putting it into practical terms and how that can work out and how farmers to founders are actually supporting their 
supporting them right the way through the program. What what are some sort of bigger failings that new ag tech ventures and startups are we seeing currently? Maybe before the COVID pandemic, or maybe that's driven some more out. What's going on in the space, Christine? Um, look, I'm not sure it's unique to ag tech or, or um, startups in our sector, but, you know, I think Daryl's really given you a really good insight there into, you know, often people are just jumping into the solution and they're thinking that they've got to take that solution quite a long way down the track before they get out and, and, and really test and validate that with customers. I think that's probably the biggest hurdle that, or even if it's not a failing, it's a hurdle that people have got to get their head around. Um, I think a lot of people are fairly loath to talk to customers until they've got something that looks beautiful and it's perfect and they're almost embarrassed to kind of share an idea at that early stage or they might have a misplaced belief that they're going to get lose their IP or whatever. Uh, so that definitely is, you know, we really focus on that at the beginning of our, uh, our journey type program, so in Hatch. But even we find, you know, more mature businesses that come into our later stage programs that we haven't seen before we often have to take them back to that basic because they might have, I don't know, by luck and chance got themselves to a certain point, but then they get stuck or they don't know how to go to that, you know, new market or that scale up. And one of the fundamentals is really getting that understanding of their customer, their customer segment, the problem they're trying to solve and the value that their solution delivers to that customer. And so that's the most fundamental principle, if you like, all the way through. And then the lean startup methodology really helps you go through that quickly, fail fast without having spent a whole bunch of money, um, and then move on, pivot, you know, get your idea into a position where it is really, or your solution into a position that it's really going to solve a problem. And that's really going to be the basis of success. Then there's a whole bunch of other hurdles, which we probably haven't got time to talk about today that, you know, businesses go through, they Sometimes they get themselves into a, a mindset that, you know, this is what my business looks like and it's not scalable. So they've, they've got a whole process, if you like, that you really can't replicate at, at scale. And so as they get a little bit further down the track, I think that's probably one of the biggest hurdles is how do I make this scalable? How do I turn this into a, a small, very successful local business into something that's really going to um, be able to be delivered to a much, much wider market? Um, yeah, we work with all kinds of um, founders and, and entrepreneurs. So whilst producers are, when we're working in the ag tech space, producers as customers are always at the centre of the innovation. And we also believe that producers themselves can actually solve a lot of these problems and hence why we, we encourage those that are interested to come through as founders in their own right. I think in value adding, it's not, I mean, we're talking a lot about ag tech, but, you know, as you know, we, we also work in the value adding space. We yep. tend to more exclusively work with producers as value adders in that space rather than uh, in this business anyway, rather than with any other kind of entrepreneurs. And I guess that's because we have this fundamental belief that um, firstly, that commodities are not the, the future, if, if that makes sense, if we're really going to capitalise and get really high value from our, what is a very precious resource, which is our agricultural systems and our land, then we need to start valuating more in Australia. And we think producers are ideally positioned to take a leadership role in that area um, because they understand their products, they can and, and want to get closer to consumers. Consumers are looking more for that kind of provenance and connection to where their food is coming from. Um, and it also provides a, a, a really fantastic opportunities for producers not only to create value for end consumers, but to actually capture that value back on their farm and not feel like they've lost connection to that value chain through to the end consumer, if that makes sense. And then if I was thinking about, okay, if I'm thinking about that kind of business, is there, a, is there an area of failure? And um, I think probably it's just that ability to sort of think that as being something um, as a producer that you can do also at, at scale. I think a lot of producers are come to us with what I would call very modest concepts about what they want to be able to achieve. And there's no problem with that. That's a great place to start. But I think, you know, seeing producers start to have their eyes open, as, as Daryl said, to look above the gate into, into, the, into the not so far away horizon and see what's possible for them as a business and to really start to grow their business. We've got some great examples um, going on at the moment in Australia. We've got um, one of the companies that have come through our program is uh, Pip Lawson from South Australia, Pinaroo Farms. You know, she started really modest, 
and she's now she's still quite small but she's really got a growth mindset which is fantastic to see and we can't claim credit but our cows another business in Australia that have um, loved to be able to <laughs> claim credit for them but we haven't we haven't worked with them directly but um, you know they are another example where there's such great opportunity for producers to both create value but also capture value back on farm and that's what producers need to do yeah I think to survive. with those two examples with Pip with Pinaroo Farms and also our cow they're pure examples of where farmers can actually get to and I think some farmers may actually look at them as competition. I think to break down those barriers, there's so much room for new ventures within this sort of space and both domestically and internationally. And you can probably touch on a lot more of that. But for these sort of ag tech ventures, how can we prevent the failings for this? Is it improving their structures and bringing them through these programs? So you've got the Hatch program. And what was the other program that you're running? Um, so we run a series, uh, sort of, if you come through in a linear way, you would come in early in our hatch program. That's for those that have really just got an idea back of the envelope sort of thing, scratching out a few thoughts. Um, and that's where that customer validation is the really key thing that we drum in. And we really focus on that for a really concentrated six-week period. Um, and then then we all know, including the, the the farmer or the founder, they know it's worth going forward with. If they don't have something that they validate with customers it's hugely risky to keep going at that point so we really encourage them to do that and do lots of customer interviews and so on the next stage is we call hone that's where you're kind of honing that idea and turning it into a real business venture a real business opportunity so that's a longer program um, it's got a lot more detail in in terms of business operations for those that don't have that experience we give them that kind of exposure and support through our experts um, and mentors and and professional service firms that we work with um, but also that that's where they're starting to turn that idea into something more tangible so you can start with a very low res prototype which is might be just a mock-up that you can show somebody a picture of and then going through the stages during the home program of turning that into a more getting close to, if not a fully working um, MVP or minimum viable product that you can get out into the market, get it tested, even get some early revenue from it. Um, but also looking at, you know, where should I focus? What's my go to market strategy? What channels should I be selling through? What's my marketing look like? So that home is a real business venture creation program and then for people who who go through that stage as I said before it's usually like three three six nine twelve months or even 18 months before they're ready for our next program which is the scale up so they'll come into our harvest program the last one or the last one um, on this on this particular series that um, you know they've probably got revenue they've certainly got customers trialing and giving positive feedback about the products that they've got in the market they might be at a fairly local scale or small scale and now's the time to start to think about what do I need to do to make this truly a scalable business? And we always encourage people to look globally at the right time, whether they be an ag tech or evaluating business. Um, Australia is an export country and there's no reason why we can't be exporting smart tech as well. Um, so that's what the Harvest Program is about. It's, it's very much sort of lifting your eyes up into that really growth uh, mindset and 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 accelerating that process and then as I said we have other programs that look specific at specific markets like Grow to Asia is a program that we run where people are interested in looking at that ASEAN marketplace. Absolutely the horizons for ag tech and also from the farmer side becoming founders has never looked so much brighter. Um, really intriguing to see what the problem first approach how does that lead us into greater success as farmers to founders um, going through that process, being able to actually establish the problem first and going through to a solution, maybe that's very adding to improve the return that we're getting as farmers as well. Maybe if you want to use PIP as an example there with their lentils, um, quite, a, quite variable of what they've done with their product as well, but also giving something to consumers, um, quite an alternative as well. Yeah, look, it's really interesting. When we work with producers as our founders, particularly in the value-adding space, typically there's two kinds of problems that we're trying to, they're trying to solve and we're trying to help them solve. So, and Pip's a really great example of this as a lentil producer. Um, the problem she was trying to solve for herself and their own farming business was the downgrading of a, a you know a pretty significant proportion of their offtake of their of their lentil harvest. So they weren't meeting specifications or they 
um, you know, they just weren't fitting into the market at the value that they needed to get the return for their investment. Um, and, and the other side of it too was the kind of the volatility of that commodity marketplace, which is pretty pretty typical for, for most um, most agricultural um, commodities. So she was trying to solve that problem. How do I make this a more uh, sustainable business, if that makes sense, by growing these crops? Interestingly, she was as a consumer, as a mother, she was also trying to solve a problem for her own family. She had some fussy eaters and kids in the family, you know, young children who, who weren't, you know, she didn't feel like she was able to get them to eat the kind of right kind of healthy foods and what was available to her in the supermarket wasn't going to meet her needs. So she wanted to solve that problem. And then, then it was just almost serendipitous in the first instance that the solution to that came together, those two problems into her first product, which was a, a lentil flour. And she was able to start not only getting uh, or understanding what she could do with the downgraded lentils, but also solve her own personal problem. And then, you know, it snowballed from their family, friends and so on. And she thought, oh, okay, maybe there's a business idea here. Maybe there's, there's plenty of other lentil producers with the same problem that I can work with. And there's also heaps of other consumers that have got the sort of problems. And so she really, when she first came into um, our early stage program, it was really, because she'd never really thought about consumers before other than just being one herself. Um, and so for her, the real, um, I guess, epiphany for her was those customer interviews and really understanding what the problems that other consumers were trying to solve, whether it would be, you know, um, healthy food, you know, something that was going to have that high protein component to it, things that they could incorporate into menus that uh, were going to solve their fussy eater problems or health concerns or whatever it might be. So she did a lot of really great work doing her customer interviews and understanding really clearly what the problem that consumers were having. And then she's obviously gone on from there and built a business and understood about a value chain and how she gets things manufactured. And so she's learned all of those sorts of things. But I think it was that problem first. Solving that problem for consumers was really what gave her the insight to grow a really what's going to be a really amazing business. This episode is brought to you by Farmers to Founders. If you've got an idea for a new business, ag tech solution or value added food product, Farmers to Founders can help you turn it into reality. No matter what stage you're at, their programs will support you to develop your business skills, access expert mentors, and tap into an extensive network of potential customers. Head to farmers2founders.com, that's with a number two, to check out how you can get involved or drop them an email for a yarn. So looking at solving those problems, Christine, with the story of PIP with Pinaroo Farms and how they discovered to improve the process of their lentils and actually add value to their farm. I think that's a fabulous story and there's a lot more out there that could possibly happen um, and how we can nurture those through along with these programs such as Farmers to Founders to start to contribute towards their own success on farm, but actually maybe take them on that journey that you mentioned before, the journey of going into leadership and also becoming a founder. But also, Daryl, you might have some input on that, that journey yourself and how other ag tech founders out there, maybe at different stages of it, how how does that help them become the leader and to drive commercialization um, and to actually find this success at the back of knowing what the problem is and also coming up with the solution through the different stages? Yeah, I just want to touch on a couple of points that Christine raised before. I guess as a, a founder and a producer, sometimes we get really attached to our solution and we hold on to it for too long when the reality, and then that can lend, lead to a lot of those failures. So I've seen a lot of failures where people keep pushing that same barrow and they're not listening producers or end customers. Um, so I think that's a really key point is really to start to understand how you can actually talk to customers and drill down without offering your lens or bias and what you think they need um, and, and, and solve that, keep solving that problem and keep iterating until you solve that problem. Um, so I, re I really feel that is the really key thing. And I guess as founders, we have a, and farmers, we have a lot of trouble actually going out and asking people. Um, but as we um, take people on the, the journey in this course, um, yeah, around is a bit, 
afraid about doing that. And once you actually go and talk to a farmer and you ask them what their problems are, uh, and they, they tend to actually keep going and tell you and, and get right into the detail. Um, I haven't seen too many farmers not want to talk about their issues. Uh, so that, that, that's the biggest thing is actually getting over that fear, getting over the fear of um, holding on to your idea and, and flogging that horse till it, it's, yeah, it, and having a really severe failure. Whereas if uh, they can learn to um, focus on the customer problem and move and iterate to keep to solving that or aiming to solve that, uh, definitely re reduces the risk of failure and becomes a key skill um, because this is a, uh, a bit of an innovation ecosystem in ag in Australia. So once all of these producers are really interested, start adopting some of these new technologies, it offers more problems and more opportunities. So there'll be lots of other things keeping on coming through. So, um, yeah. How do you see like the mindset, the switch of mindset going into the role of becoming a founder as a farmer, we're both producers, innovators, and also consumers, consumers of the food and the products that are helping us farm better, but also we're at the beginning of the supply chain coming up with the solutions to problems and maybe taking them to commercial. How do you see mindset playing a role within this journey of becoming a farmer all the way into a founder? I guess going through the accelerator to then understand, to give you the skills to actually look up at the horizon. Cause I guess as a producer and my old man working on, we always are just following the commodity market and you know, they've never actually thought about how they could do value adding. Uh, and same as trying to fix a certain problem uh, on the farm, uh, they were just stuck in that way and not look up to see what other ways are actually that could be solved. So I think that's the big, uh, the big win out of actually people participating in these accelerators is to change that mindset, to have that growth mindset and look at that bigger picture and that excites them to um, go out and, uh, and have the drive to, to um, solve that and get that out and, and you know, take away pain from producers is nothing better than and seeing a producer be more productive, more efficient, and uh, and taking less risk out of their enterprise because they're, they're you know they're putting the the farm on the line most seasons. So uh, anything that we can do to help them is a, is a great outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And I think farmers make so many decisions each day, and especially if they they've got these great ideas, they're trying to bring them to fruition for their own farm and also taking that commercially, whether it's barry aiding in their family are the taste testers. Um, how can we help the farmers reduce the amount of hats they are coming through and how is farmers to founders sort of employing this as well, supporting them right the way through the process as an ag tech or barry aiding platform? I might jump in there, Jack. I think probably one of the things that really distinguishes farmers to founders, um, and it's something that was really important to us in when we started the business, was to, to be able to genuinely say we understand the life of a producer. And I think that's one of the reasons why we saw a really big gap in the marketplace for farmers when they're fulfilling this role as founders, is that, you know, they just... Uh, the, the other accelerator programs just didn't seem to meet their needs. Either the, they were alienated by the language of the startup world in the first instance, so they felt like there was this whole other terminology that they weren't familiar with, and if they wanted to even think about pursuing an idea, they had to somehow learn this. Um, so we try and really demystify and de-jargonise, if I can put it that way, the whole process. And, and so we, we're all, most of us come from some form of farming background, um, and so we 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 really think that we empathise with farmers and understand even just that most fundamental barrier sometimes to doing this, which is the confidence to to get in and 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 be able to talk about these sorts of things. Another one was um, you know the the kinds of technologies that are being used in in accelerator programs, and particularly these days with the virtual accelerator programs. So we spend a lot of time onboarding our founders, um, making sure that they're comfortable with Slack channels and you know Kajabi workspaces and Google Drives and all of the other tools that they might not be familiar with. So indeed, mystifying that part of it as well. And then probably one of the most fundamental ones is just the time of day and the amount of time and how do you fit it in with a 
harvest cycle. And, you know, we've had plenty of our founders doing pictures with their phone up on the, on the dashboard of the tractor. Um, and so just, you know, I guess, you know, just having the understanding and tolerance that this is the life of a farmer. They're very, as you said, they've got many hats to wear and particularly our female farmer founders, you know, they've got a whole bunch of stuff that they're expected to be doing um, both as, you know, on the farm schooling, you know, running farming businesses, trying to do this. It's it's a very complicated life and it's a bit different to kind of your typical young gun, 25-year-old IT SaaS developer in Melbourne who's, that's all they got to do basically. And they can go into an accelerate, accelerator program and it's, it's all pretty familiar and comfortable for them. So I think that's one of the ways that we're really... Um, trying our best anyway to to really support farmers in this in this in this journey that they're on and this exciting journey and really a journey that's got so much opportunity for them but to really make it um fit in if you like in an appropriate way in 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 all of those other complexities of their life yeah absolutely and as you stated it is an exciting journey whether you make it from stage one to stage six of your business maybe you make it to stage one and don't get onto stage two but you take that those failings and you sort of pivot. For yourself, Daryl, and your expertise, how do you see pivoting and do you actually see it much within the ag tech and very adding space from they've come up with this conceptual sort of idea in the beginning and they've gone, I think this is great, They've and they've taken it to the minds of farmers, the founders, and you're sort of suggesting that pivoting in a sort of different direction to take it to consumers um, to have that improve that uptake, have you seen that pivotable sort of st stances and stages for the different founders out there? Yeah, we see it a lot, especially in the early stage, which is the great time to do that because once they go out there and, and get a wider view of the actual customers, whether they're on those different types of farmers, and then understand that pain point rather than their bias and view. So, in that early stage, we, we, we do see a lot of um, slight different changes, which is ideally what the program's doing. So that's a great success. Rather than those founders going down the road, putting their farm, putting a whole, you know, a couple of years into something, market it, they haven't even validated it with their neighbor or anyone else, and then put it out the market and, and have, a, have a really hard failure, uh, then those people probably don't come back. So we lose that entrepreneurial capacity because they've had a hard failing. People get quite, um, you know, um, you know, they have opinions on themselves about, hey, shit, we've you know, failed really hard. Um, and it's switching them to go, it's okay to have the wrong idea right now, like and get in that process of, of you know, taking their bias and, and opinion out of it. Yeah, and probably does timing play a, quite a large role in that with it? timing for the industry, but also timing for the consumers at the other end who may be actually able to use these products. Is that an element to the factor? Timing is a huge thing, I guess, as these um, technologies will scale out. Um, we've seen multiple technologies come in and they're going to solve everything in the world for producers. Uh, they don't have the right business model or it's the wrong time or the producers don't have the ability to understand the outputs of it. Um, drones are probably a good example where people were trying to sell drones to everyone six, seven years ago and they'll sell everything. And what you see seeing now is a total different business model where um, ag tech drone operators are coming as in there and have got a, a, you know, they're as a service. So producers don't have to buy a drone outright and learn the site. So and then the producer can actually see an ROI and a value from that and go, okay, I've used that for a couple of seasons. Now I'll actually go in and, and spend more money and do this and have it a bit more of a permanent fixture. Um, so timing is, is going to be quite crucial in a lot of these new technologies. They need to get out into the market, need to have validation from producers, show that they have that ROI and, and then they'll scale it. Yeah, definitely. And as the saying goes, there's lots of solutions looking for problems. Do you think this rings true for from your perspective within the ag tech industry? All these solutions looking for the problems yeah definitely you know um another example i guess blockchain six seven years ago was yep. you know everyone was a blockchain developer and they just had a hammer and they were looking any <laughs> anything to whack that solution on top and not really uh build find out that problem and adjust that whole solution to fix that problem so yeah we've seen that and that's uh that's a risk 
I guess, um, for technology companies to continually just bang it as a solution that's going to fix everything in one go. Um, but, but I think as the markets are uh, maturing and as um, people are being aware more of these new technologies, uh, it's enabling us to get more value and ROI to producers. Absolutely. And this is one for probably both of you to answer. What sort of advantage do you think a farmer has to being at the leader of an ag tech or value adding for their own sort of product? Do you think it's advantageous to have the farm to actually trial and test? How do you play, see how this plays a role within your founders currently? I think probably um, it was one of the reasons why we, you know, the reasons why we thought Farmers to Founders was a good idea in the first place to start was because we actually had an experience where we were doing a practice pitch day and we had some hardcore tech developers um, doing their pitch. And then we had some of our, our early um, producer-led tech solution founders doing their pitch. And the thing that came across really strongly to us was that the farmers were much more open to this core thing that we've been talking about during this, um, this, this session, which is farmers understand the problems. They understand that there is a problem. That's the probably yeah. sounds really fundamental, but they actually understand that. And, and they're usually driven by that desire to solve that problem for themselves. So I think that's really the the superpower that farmers have got is that they get it. They understand that there's a problem to be solved. They may not have all the tech skills and all of the other business skills or whatever it might be to build a business around it, but they definitely get this point. So I think that's probably their, their most fundamental um, unique value proposition, if you like, for themselves. I think, yeah, having a farm to test it on, understanding that agricultural, you know, some of those nuances of, of having customers that are producers, that all gives them an advantage as well um, and so to me that's why why it's really great working with farmer-led founders i mean we, we work with tech founders as well yeah. but we try and get them to understand producers so we get them connected to producers and talking to them and really recognizing they have to start to switch their mindset more into thinking about that but farmers have kind of got that naturally if that makes sense so yeah, it's right. a quicker process for them it probably adds to them telling their story, making it a lot easier to market their products, their services out there to other like farmers or even to consumers for very adding sort of products um, to be able to consume both domestically and internationally and how that can be advantageous for any sort of farmer looking to become their founder, lead the way on their own farm, do you think? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it is. As I said, I think it's their superpower. It's their advantage. But probably um, what we believed was that that superpower wasn't being recognised or wasn't being given a, a vehicle to, to kind of optimise the outcome that could be achieved by deploying that really problem mindset into, into developing solutions. So, yeah, I think, and, and, and I'm sure that's replicable globally um, and we know it is. Yeah, absolutely. And have you actually seen an up in farmers looking to become founders over the years since 2018, since operation, nearly five years into it? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, we 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 do recruitment for our programs. We don't um, we don't typically have a lot of problems getting uh, you know a really good selection of, yeah. of both farmer led and tech led founders to come and and work in the programs or to join the program. Um, whether there's been an uptick, it's hard to say. I think probably we we're all assuming that as more younger um farm aligned people go back onto the farm there might be might be uh this might be a more exciting proposition for them or something that they're more inclined to complement their farming passion with their with their confidence i suppose with technology as well so we probably are seeing as we go forward younger ones we've even had um a 17 year old in our program too so yeah i think we will see an uptick as as more young people go back onto the farm i think we've seen that during covid people have gone back to their regional or rural lifestyle um, and then probably looking for opportunities such as this. Yeah, just naturally sort of looking for an extra income, but also that may be the way of where some beautiful ag tech or very ads are actually added into it as well for husband and wife sort of teams. It works quite well for them to develop a product and sort of rehash on that and what sort of works and Given the support of farmers to founders, I think it's really good. Um, yeah, we actually do work. 
sorry, we, we actually do work with quite a lot of um, husband and wife or couple teams, um, both in ag tech and value adding. And I think obviously it's there's pros and cons working with your partner, but in a, in a startup business, it can become quite stressful having done it myself. Um, but and, and you're kind of always switched on. You're always working, if that makes sense. But, you know, there's some real great advantages. Um, and I think, you know, I don't want to overplay it, but there's a really fantastic opportunity for female farmer founders yep. here. And uh, and that's something that at Farmers to Founders, you know, we're really passionate about. We think both in the, it, it, it doesn't seem to be such a barrier for female founders, uh, farmer founders to come through on evaluating uh, interest because as you say they're consumers they're often mothers they, you know they're solving problems for their own family uh, but we see equally great opportunities for ag tech for um, female farmers to to start to think about you know what what could they work on in this space as well and um, and certainly those females who do come into this space into the ag tech space do so well they're so good at it um, so we're really we're on a bit of a mission to encourage more even young girls who might be at school still or at university maybe they come from a farming background um, to really start to see those opportunities on the tech side as well as the value adding. Yeah, absolutely. I see it as a huge opportunity out there um, for farmers and the women within agriculture just to see what sort of problems you are having on farm or what sort of trends consumers are having or what they're wanting, the needs, the wants of consumers change all the time. And I think Australian agriculture and agriculture in general is looking to adapt a little bit more to the taste of what consumers are, um, especially on the very ad side of that as well. Yeah, and as we know, it's often the woman on the farm who is responsible for that second income, that yep. alternative income. And, you know, they might be working in town or, you know, they might be a professional, nursing, teaching, whatever, which is all great careers. But, you know, hey, how much better would it be if they could actually deploy their skill sets into something that's, you know, not only going to bring that income, but it's going to solve problems uh, for themselves as well. And, and it's really connected, I suppose, to their, their core reason, which is their farming business. Yeah, absolutely. And that leads us into talking about what Farmers and Founders key activities, your programs across the two business streams are, what are they and how are they actually helping farmers bring their ideas to light, um, whether depending whatever sort of stage they are at, yeah, basically, um, we've got multiple business streams, but the two ways we think about our business is very much this venture creation part of our business. So these are the pathways that we've been talking about, the development of new tech solutions or value-adding businesses. So that's one core part of our business. They're very complementary. The other, I guess, and, and in there we do, as I said, tech and value-adding. And so the other side of that coin, I suppose, is the um, accelerated adoption so we see lots of opportunity to think a little bit differently about the whole adoption and extension piece. I think there's a lot of money being spent in Australia and it has been for a long time on trying to, I would probably describe it as force feeding technology onto producers and then believing that the problem is some kind of innate barrier or resistance that farmers have to change. We don't actually see it like that. We think that the accelerating adoption and commercialization is actually a two-sided coin. And without sort of going over again all of the things that we've we've already been talking about, it's it's if you like the responsibilities on both sides, it's both the producers themselves, and these are producers who may not necessarily want to start their own tech business, but they're very open to or they are uh, very focused on trying to solve these problems that they've got themselves and they are willing to look at technology. But when they look, they can't either find something that's fit for purpose or it's, you know, too clunky or whatever. So whilst there might be problems on the producer side with capability and awareness and in some cases, but not the majority, resistance to change, um, there are also problems on the tech side. So even relatively mature businesses who don't need to come through our accelerator programs, but they're out there in the marketplace, you know, they're not really still articulating their solution in the context of how does it solve this problem. And so we see um, that's why we've got a program or stream in this space about accelerating adoption and commercialization as being something that we can work on. Once again, farmers and founders working together, not just at that very early stage, but even at a more mature stage in really understanding and being able to express how this tech solution does or in some cases does not solve that problem in a, in a really valuable way. 
Um, and so we work with the with the more mature companies who have kind of passed an acceleration stage, but helping them understand how to express their value proposition, how to really have really strong evidence about return on investment and cost benefit and all the things that we know will help drive adoption. So those are the two key, I guess, if you like, streams of our business. But if you think about it and the way we've spoken about it today, they're all part of the same journey, if you like, and they're all based on the same basic principles of you've got to have an understanding of the problem, you've got to understand your customer, you've got to make sure that your solution is solving that problem, but also you're communicating it in a way and adapting it to, to those real problems. And so it's it's a sort of continuum if you can think about it like that. And then one of the other parts of our business we call the muster, which is where we're really starting to now build up a very strong database around problem statements so that you know we've got that nuance to various parts of Australia and different sectors and different farming systems. What are these problem statements? Because sometimes the farmer themselves finds it difficult to express them. Yeah. With support, they can, and they express them very well. But sometimes they just get frustrated and they haven't got time to express those problem statements. So there's sort of like a a, a wall between the tech providers and the and the farmers who they're trying to serve and just even getting that problem statement out on the table. And so that's one of the things that we're also starting to, to work on is how do we get that communication going at the right stage? Yeah, well, it seems a common theme to get the communication flowing between both the founders, the ag tech companies, and also the farmers to get that out on the table to actually see what the problem is. And if it is being solved very interesting that there is two sides to the coin from your perspective and i'd imagine you've seen a fair few sort of templates ag tech companies with the, these troubles of adoption or perceived troubles of adoption i think that's been a, quite a big talking point for australian ag tech especially the adoption rate uh, there's not enough early adopters out there when are we going to get mass adoption um, for our australian agriculture what sort of stage do you think we are I would say as a farmer as well, there were quite early early stages as farmers looking towards technology, maybe as the generational sort of shift comes along that will push us to look towards these new innovations. What sort of stage do you think we are at now and where can we be in the next five years? Um, I'll take that one. So yeah, I feel the on-farm adoption is a really key piece. And if we get that right in the next five years, we really make a big difference. Um, so it's an added infancy at the moment. Um, I think it can be done a lot better. And I guess in some of the programs we're doing in F2F are looking at those different business models. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm a bit older than you, so my old man's I'm 75 and still chasing cattle around, um, it's going to be very hard for him to really um, dig into analysis of, um, you know, a lot of feed budgeting and forecasting and, and getting right into how he's going to make business decisions. So what's the alternative to that? So he relies on me to interpret a lot of the tech because I keep putting tech on his farm. And he, um, so what's the right business model there and who are the intermediaries to allow them to make decisions and help with that adoption cycle? Um, and in my earlier days in my uh, first company, we were building an automated irrigation system. And when we went out the farm, even though you could see it on the phone that the pump switch and the valves open and close, we basically went around with the producer for a week, sat there, watched it to make sure it works because the risk is the producers are putting the farm on, on a bet every season and it got so much variability. Uh, and it's a lot to go and trust a, an ag tech company um, that it's, you know, with all of these promises are going to make a big decision. So I think there's lots of um, stages of on-farm adoption. It could be smart farms that are run by the state ag departments that are there as a bit of a, a showcase. Uh, and then the next stage is how do we get it out into the other producers that aren't in the early adopter stage. So how do we actually make it easier and those bigger group of producers to be able to trust that tech uh, 24 seven, you know, 365 days a year for them to be able to move into the benefits that are coming. So if we get this right in the next five years, that really advances the industry. Um, you know, there's a huge opportunity for agri-tech in Australia to be a 40, $60 billion industry on its own that we export to the world. Yeah, I think 
for Australian farmers, if we were like any other sort of industry, we'd have a an ag tech officer, but not all sort of farms can actually have the ability to do that. Uh, with the two band two man teams out there with the family farmers, I, that it's quite frequent. Um, getting someone to be adjust with the ag tech and having that adoption onto the farm, but actually stripping it back to see what sort of new technologies could be adopted onto each farm. Why is there a need and how can we establish that as the farmer, but also filtering through to see what sort of technologies we can get on board? How does that work? Yeah, look, I think you've raised a really real issue there, Jack, which is that sort of resource capability and just sheer time available to those, particularly those smaller family businesses. Um, and so Daryl touched on a moment ago the role of intermediaries, and, and I think that's one that we can really look at uh, and dive into a lot more deeply, the, the role of trusted intermediaries. Um, and they, they have many different hats on from agronomists to consultants. And, and these are people who part of their day-to-day -day business is out there on the farm, um, and we're certainly looking to tap into that um, to that part of the of the ecosystem and and see really whether there's an evolving role and an evolving business model for for them in this whole ag tech and adoption space. So that that rather than expecting the farmer um, with their limited time and and financial and and human resources to try and do all of this for themselves to really create a more kind of uh, viable model where they can they can trust the person. I think. A lot of farmers get um, a bit bombarded by the tech companies, and so they're always having someone knock on the door or come down the come down the path um, and saying, "Like this is the best thing for you. This is going to be great. It's going to solve everything." And they just get overwhelmed by that, and they just haven't got the time. And so, having that trusted intermediary, I think, is going to be a really key part of the future. And and I think we've got a really good resource available to us um, in Australia with with some very highly qualified and capable people you know, in those kinds of roles, but maybe not having previously been exposed themselves to ag tech, but they're more open maybe to, to building their capability and then being that being that interface, if you like, um, and more objective for the producer. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that having that communication line effectively quite open with the producers and the farmers at an early stage for these ag tech companies make for a more compelling adoption prospect further down the line? I think it'll take away quite a few of the barriers, not necessarily all of them, but I think it will definitely open up a lot more opportunities and it'll probably be a bit of a tipping point as, as Daryl said before, you know, Australia's got some really fantastic early adopters, tech enthusiast type producers. Unfortunately, you know, they're, they're a small proportion of the industry and we all try and uh, talk to them all the time because they're very willing. Um, but really what's that next wave of producers who are kind of not quite there, but are but are potentially open. And so I think that's where these trusted intermediary roles are going to make a real, a really big difference. They're going to help those producers get across the line, if that makes sense. But, you know, keep in mind, this is a two-sided coin here. It's not all just about the producers having to change or to adopt. It's also about the tech companies themselves making that commitment to really understand their customer. Um, and so there's, I, I guess there's a change practices that is required from the tech solution providers right from you know when they're developing their solutions if they come through a program like us they're going to have that hammered into them anyway and uh, and hopefully get it right but even if they haven't been through a program I think there's that real there's that really critical need to open themselves up to not thinking they know what the answer is necessarily but to really dig into what is the problem they're trying to solve and 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 the nuances of that problem so get out there get your feet dirty, get on the farm um, and really work with your customer. It's a pretty basic thing. I mean, it applies to any kind of, you know, business model, but it's just funny. Sometimes people don't do that and they, they sort of think they already know and it's what's the problem with the customer. They don't get it or they're not smart enough or they're not digitally savvy or whatever, some excuse. But, you know, often that's not a true statement. It's, it's, it's two-sided. There's responsibility and opportunity on both sides. As farmers, I think, we're welcoming to anyone coming on to solve our sort of problems um, to see what's out there, especially. And also to touch on the farmers being hesitant and also creating that feedback loop. Maybe farmers would be less hesitant if we can become a part of the development stage of the ag tech. Um, I know case studies out there are quite 
short for ag tech just to get these early adopters and maybe peer-to-peer -peer learning where farmers actually really start to see this adoption through events. Um, podcasting is quite good for it as well, but also seeing what your neighbor's doing, if they've adopted a new product that's helping them revolutionize what they do or just improving their time, saving them some money or even earning them some more money, um, it's going to play a huge amount of value into that adoption rate for yourself. But how can we get across this sort of hump or hesitation? Do you see hesitation um, and the ability for farmers out there to adopt? So I just want to reiterate, I guess, the, the thing about the intermediaries, I think that is a really big opportunity. Um, so I feel bundling of solutions that can talk to each other and, and five solutions that go on that an intermediary can understand and help um, transition and adopt onto a farm is probably going to start being that bigger win because I guess the early adopters are being quite good at going, okay, I can get a 3% on this tech and I'll get another 2% over here. And they're quite willing to learn those six or seven things they adopt. Uh, but when you probably go to, I guess, that um, bigger group who, who potentially might not be as um, digital savvy, them to go and learn 10 different solutions and understand how they uh, work together and then um, you know interact is quite complicated. So I feel um, how the tech companies can bundle stuff together to allow those intermediaries to get that larger adoption of maybe five things onto the farm at once and you get a 20% increase in time or productivity or whatever that is, is I feel a really big opportunity. Yeah, I think as we sort of progress in using these ag tech companies all together um, and sort of removing them from the silos, that might actually make this adoption rate move a lot quicker. Um, have you seen that sort of play a role within Australian ag tech with the silos and, and ag tech space? It's the, it's the early start to this. And I think there's a lot of um, opening up where all the ag tech companies are talking to each other to understand that that's going to help move that uh, faster pace of adoption. So yeah, there was definitely a, a lot of talk. So, you know, probably when it all started, there were a lot of silos, but I think everyone's realizing where we're going to go and get that volume and that faster pace adoption. We've got to break down those silos, interact. So those producers get that bigger uptake or big and, and bigger wins by combinations of multiple technologies at once. Amazing. Well, I think what we've learned across this episode today is for open communications, it's quite a journey for ag tech to founders, farmers to founders, um, to take their ideas and commercialize them out into domestic and also take them internationally and see how we can get this adoption rate uh, working with farmers and also the ag tech working with the farmers to get their boots dirty, as you said, Christine. What would be your last sort of piece of farms advice you'd like to pass on to anyone looking to have an idea out in the space? Yeah, going through what we've heard from this episode today, this session, taking us through the journey from farmers to founders and how we're having problem, solving that problem with solutions on farm, um, whether that be through value adding or ag tech solutions, looking to take them through commercialization through farmers to founders um, with the likes of Christine and Daryl um, in-house there within ag tech and how entrepreneurship can play a role and keeping that communication line open is vitally important. Um, as we move towards a leadership role as a founder, Christine, you would know all about that. But what would be one piece of farms advice that you'd like others, future founders out there to take away from this episode um, to take their idea to the next sort of level? I guess my core piece of advice would be understand the problem you're trying to solve for your customer, understand who your customers are, and then really dig in with them um, to understand what it is that is causing them pain. And then you can definitely develop your idea around that and keep validating it and iterating it as you go through the journey. The other piece of advice I would give to founders, and this sounds like a bit of a marketing tool from us, but, um, you know, get help. Don't just try and do this all by yourself. Don't make assumptions. Don't spend a heap of money and a huge amount of time and effort trying to do it by yourself. Get out there, get, in, get yourself into a program that works for you and, and really learn the tools, but also just as importantly, make the connections and, and develop that um, whole network of people who can help you 
make this a reality for you. And if you do that, it's an amazing opportunity. 100%. And it probably opens up more opportunities. The greater your network grows along with that, both for yourself and also for your products um, as you develop them further through the stage. But for yourself, Daryl, as the ag tech entrepreneur in residence, you don't like that label, but what would be your sort of farm's advice you'd like to pass along to any budding founders out there, both in the early and also the maturity stages? Uh in the early stages, get out there and talk to it about that idea as, uh, to as many people in a wider area because that's going to potentially open up some different perspectives and other insights and inputs that help you focus. And that's all after you've done everything Christine said is understand the problem from the producer, then go and, and look through whatever social media or LinkedIn to find that expertise in other areas to add some further depth on, the, on a way at how you could solve that. Um, and for the more mature, um, I guess, founders who have been on the journey a fair bit more is really around ensuring you get out there and, and validate it with producers and show that ROI and show how it works and, and make sure you, you know, test it in lots of different scenarios so you can build that global company to expand and sell a product all around the world. Amazing. Well, hopefully a few budding founders have listened into this episode and I can't wait to see what this series brings for the listeners of Farms Advice, but also for the greater community of what Farms the Founders, what you're doing and it, adding that su further support to these budding founders, the leaders within Australian agriculture. Christine and Daryl, thank you very much for coming on to the, this episode and I'm looking forward to the next ones and more. This Farms Advice episode does not stop here. Come and join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. And even join our Facebook group. Go to farmsadvice.com.au for more on this episode and spread the hashtag Farms Advice to your mates. If you can leave a review on Apple or Spotify, that will let other farmers find us too. But until then, see you next Tuesday. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Farm Size podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia so and their connections to land, sea, Wait and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people today.